So now let's look more closely at how natural selection occurs. Uh, and with natural selection, we're basically looking at how inherited traits, which can allow a species uh, to be more fit to survive in their environment and reproduce, are the traits that are considered fittest. So when we talk about fitness, what we're talking about in the biological sense is not necessarily fitness, you know, you're, you're fit, you work out at the gym and you're equipped to be fast or strong. Um, fitness in this sense basically means the capacity to pass on your genes to the next generation. So an evolutionary, an evolutionarily fit species are those whose genes are represented with the most frequency in the next generation. Um, here's an example. So here we have two different caterpillars. Um, let's say they're the same species, but one of them has a little bit more fuzz on it or hair on it than the other. Um, so because we know that there's variation in genes, uh, when you have organisms reproducing sexually, you have the potential for a lot of variation. And so in that genetic variation, you have different characteristics and so different um, potential uh, abilities to survive changing conditions. So they say here the struggle for survival in the natural environment, living organisms face many problems, competition, predators, climate changes, and there are differences. So the hairy caterpillar versus the naked caterpillar um, lead to different outcomes for them. Um, some characteristics are more favorable in helping an individual to survive. So as we look at these caterpillars and we look at the concept of survival of the fittest, um, that basically means individuals with favorable characteristics are better adapted to their environment and more likely to survive and breed and pass on the genes for those favorable characteristics. And so what we see with a caterpillar is that let's say in this example, the birds that eat caterpillars, they tend to prefer the non-hairy varieties of caterpillars. You know, they don't like the taste of something that's hairy or maybe those little hairs um, can harm them, you know, maybe they're poisonous. So the birds are going to prefer the naked caterpillars. So what does that mean? It means that if you're a hairy caterpillar, you have a better chance of surviving and passing on your genes. So that is a trait that is more favorable and thus those are the more fit varieties of caterpillar to survive. If we apply this over many generations and to the point where you have genetic differences between hairy and non-hairy caterpillars that are very great, they can't interbreed anymore, then we would say they're two separate species. We would say speciation has occurred where uh, new species emerge. And so that's kind of a nice example of how um, survival of the fittest works. And I like to say that it's not really about survival as much as it is about reproduction. It doesn't matter how long an organism survives, it matters if it breeds and passes on its genes. So really it should be reproduction of the fittest. So in order for this to occur, in order to have natural selection occurring in a population, um, a few conditions have to be met. Uh, more organisms are born than can survive. So you have to have more organisms born than are capable of surviving in those conditions. Um, there's limiting factors, competition, disease, predators, environmental conditions. Um, so all of these challenges will basically keep every single individual from surviving. Some of them will die. The second uh, condition that has to be met is that organisms must vary in their characteristics, also within the species. So here's a great example. Here's a Great Dane and here's a Chihuahua. Both of them are the same species. They are both Canis domesticus, the same um, species of domestic dog. But you can see they look nothing alike. There is so much variation in genes among dogs, among that one species, that we have, in this case, different breeds. So dog breeds are created by selectively breeding, but they're technically the same species. There's just different, uh, there's a lot of varieties um, within the species. So. The individuals, again, with traits that happen to give them a survival advantage will live to breed and pass on those traits. And then finally, of the fact that variation is inherited. N none of this would work if we didn't have inheritance. So here's a little lineage of cats. You can tell that they're related because they possess the same uh, color characteristics. So you look like your parents or your grandparents or other members of your extended family because genes are inherited. And then uh, differences in reproduction and survival are due to variation among organisms. And so there's going to be differences in how well different species can reproduce and survive. Um, here's an interesting example. The Thule perch is a type of fish that can actually give live birth. Um, so there's environmental conditions that would 
account for this that would basically mean that giving live birth might be more advantageous for a fish than laying eggs under certain conditions. So the conditions mean a lot. They mean everything. Um, so that's looking at natural selection in terms of um, what's, what traits are going to be most favorable to an organism uh, within its environment and will that organism be able to pass on those traits to the next generation. Um, but of course it's not always that simple. Uh, there's always the issue of sexual selection. Um, so we're talking about why a female bird, for example, will pick one male over a different male um, is sexual selection. And um, birds are actually a great example of this because they tend to be a really great case of uh, males being very brightly colored and having very lavish and um, exciting looking feathers and trying to attract very dull looking females. So this is a type of, comp of competition that's within the species um, or intraspecific. And it's basically between members of the same gender over mates. So some physical traits, what this means for selection is that some physical traits are passed on to the next generation, not because they're useful for survival, but because they're useful in attracting mates. So let's look at peacock feathers. So here's a fun little meme with uh, peacocks. And so here's the male, he's got his big feathers and he's trying to attack the uh, female who does not have the bright colorful feathers. So having bright colorful feathers, is that really a survival advantage? Not so much. It's just about the ability to attract a female and to be able to pass on those traits. So not all characteristics are about survival. Some of them are about the ability to get a mate. So now that we've reviewed some of the big concepts of evolution, um, we're going to look at some of the misconceptions that come with it. And these are fairly common. Um, you know, it's important that when you understand that evolution is basically just a matter of genetic change over time, um, then it really kind of becomes a lot more simple than a lot of people uh, tend to think about. So there's some misconceptions. Um, one of them is that evolution is a theory about the origins of life. And that is a big misconception that you hear a lot of. Um, you know, people say, oh, you know, it didn't happen, it didn't start with evolution. Well, nobody's saying that it is. Um, evolution has nothing to do with origins. Uh, studying the origins of life is a very difficult thing in biology, and um, it's a very different field, completely different field, from studying evolutionary biology. Evolution is all about change in life over time. It's not about how it started. Another misconception um, is that evolution is like climbing a ladder. Organisms get better and better over time. And that implies that there's some sort of end goal, you know, that, that evolution works towards a goal of some ultimately perfect organism. And that's not true. Um, evolution favors what works best for an individual within a population or for a species right now. And it does not have anything to do with some end point. And if you look at, there's really some really great examples of this, of organisms that have some really bizarre characteristics. They have traits that make no sense that you would think, you know, why does this organism have this? Why does it have this trait? It has no purpose. Um, evolution is not perfect and it does not create better and better things. It's not working up some kind of ladder. Um, now that having been said, you know, we know that organisms that are less fit than others are weeded out by natural selection. So the traits produced by evolution are not always better, but they just result in what's the best given the conditions at the time. Another one is another misconception is that evolution means that life hand happens by random chance. And random is used kind of in the wrong way here. Um, there are, I mean, there's some randomness involved. Mutations are random. Um, environmental factors that can have an effect on natural selection can be random. But natural selection itself is not random. It's not random that the trait for um, fins in fish and in dolphins have evolved given that they live in an aquatic environment. That's not random. Random would be if fish evolved feathers. Okay, so this is not an issue of randomness. It's an issue of what works best in the environment at the time. Uh, finally, another misconception, um, natural selection involves organisms trying to adapt. Uh, natural selection is not a conscious process at all. Uh, so no organism is trying to adapt. This little beaver is not consciously thinking, I want a chainsaw, I want a chainsaw, give me a chainsaw evolution. That's not how it works. Um, basically, an individual in a species either has the genes that makes it good enough to pass on its genes and survive, and, and the next generation have those genes, um, or it doesn't. So it either has it or it doesn't. It's not something it can consciously choose. Uh, natural selection gives an organisms what they need. That's another misconception. 
Um, natural selection has no intentions and it's not, again, working towards some goal. So it's, this is where you see a little bit of randomness. If there's an, a natural disaster and a population happens to have the necessary genetic variation within it to survive that disaster, you know, it has traits in the population that will, that will be fitted to the new environment, um, then those individuals will have more offspring in the next generation. And ultimately, you'll see the population evolve. And if it doesn't, if, if those genes aren't there, then it won't. And it has nothing to do with what the population needs. It's simply a matter of what genes are available and how they best fit the changing environment. Another misconception is that evolution cannot be observed or proven. And this is not true at all. Evolution is observed happening constantly, especially when we study microorganisms. Um, we can see completely new species of bacteria and viruses evolve in a very short amount of time. I mean, within a matter of hours even. And so we can see it happening very rapidly, but we also see macroorganisms, you know, non-microbes evolving um, just by examining their DNA over time and looking at fossil evidence. So we can see a pretty considerable amount of evidence of evolution happening on the small scale and on the large scale. Um, then the last big misconception is that there's controversy among scientists about whether or not evolution occurs. And this is a big one. There is no controversy or debate, actually, in the scientific community on whether or not evolution occurs. Um, there is debate on some of the specifics, some of the nitty-gritty details of how it occurs, the mechanisms of natural selection, um, the mechanisms of mutation. So when people talk about the theory of evolution, they're not saying that evolution is a theory. The fact that evolution happens is indeed a fact. When they say the theory of evolution, they're talking about the intricate details that build into how evolution happens. So evolution happens, that is fact. How it happens, that's where theory comes in. And so oftentimes this nuance, these use of uh, semantics can get a little confusing. So that's it. Uh, that's our summary of evolution and natural selection. And so again, this week, we're going to be exploring this in further detail. Um, please email me if you have any questions, and we can talk about any of these details or if there's anything from your biology classes that you want to review that you don't remember. Um, enjoy the game, uh, this Darwin game. Uh, Who Wants to Live a Million Years is pretty fun. I think you'll enjoy that. And um, I've got it on the over here on the right side of the page, and this is um, on page 15.1. Uh, so enjoy that. And then, of course, there's discussion. Um, and let me know if you have questions. We've got uh, your activity. Let me see if I can pull this up for you. Understanding evolution. There we go. You've got an Ed puzzle to watch. This is a great video that will help summarize some of the concepts that we've gone over already. Um, and then you have another clip by Carl Sagan on the process of evolution. And then this is the activity, the assignment. Um, basically, are, are humans still evolving? It's an interesting question. And that's what's due um, on at the end of the week. This says the 13th. That's incorrect. I need to change that. That's actually due on the 23rd. So um, have fun, and let me know if you have any questions.